Hi, I am Jean Schumacher. Welcome to Pregnant Possibilities. My partner in crime is Dr. Deborah Shapiro. She's a board certified OBGYN and together we created the Pregnancy Advantage and our objective is to help women to get their bodies pregnant ready or provide support if you're experiencing difficulties in conceiving. Exciting news, we're working on the Baby Advantage and we're going to be, <laughs> that will take you through conception and go on. So Today on our show, we're going to be discussing raising plant-based children and the impact it has on children's health. We have an extraordinarily special guest today, who, Dr. Leanne Campbell, who was just appointed as president of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, as the center is going to expand into a new service division to focus on personal, communal, and ecological help. <laughs> wow. I mean, and totally, this is like up her alley because wow, she already has created Global Roots, globalroots.net in the Dominican Republic, which is very close to where she started out her career as a Peace Corps worker. And if you haven't seen the interview I did with her where we dove into that, oh my God, this is truly an amazing woman and a force of nature. So thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, for taking the time to be with us here today. Thank you, Jean. You're very kind. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. It's very special. I just, Thanks, before, we, <laughs> before we ask some questions, I just want to be absolutely sure that our listeners understand who you are because you represent the closest thing that we have to royalty with respect to the plant-based world and the science of plant-based nutrition because you're the daughter of T. Colin Campbell, PhD, whose China project was the largest study of diet and disease ever undertaken your father is such a wonderful man. I've spoken to him at conferences and, and um, he's, he had this incredible transformation from growing up on a dairy farm um, to, and uh, to doing this brown, groundbreaking work on casein and then actually go, originating the phrase whole food plant-based. That's him with respect to diet. So it's not, you know, not just the vegan diet, really making that distinction between a whole food plant-based diet. He's very brilliant and very kind. So I wanted to ask you to speak about your experiences growing up with Dr. Campbell as your dad. <laughs> I think people would be interested in that. And, and how, did, how did his research findings in the lab and also with the China Project actually affect you as a family? I just wondered, like, did he just come home? Like Dr. Greger talks about this. Somebody's like, he, you know, he thinks about things and he writes and he reads about the research. He comes home and all of a sudden parsley's on everything. So did he suddenly come home one day and just throw out all the milk and, and cheese? <laughs> No, that's not the way it went, actually. It was a slow transition. Uh, my father, let's see, goodness, he was at Virginia Tech when he started getting some of his findings, and, but it still wasn't enough for him to go plant-based. I think, you know, that's when some of the casein stuff, he was doing a lot of work at the time in the Philippines, and that was when I was in elementary school. And then in high school, it began more serious in high school. I think uh, that's when the, the China study was really getting underway. And he was getting some of his results back. And, you know, my, we were raised on a meat and potato diet all the way through. I mean, my parents actually always had a big garden in the yard. My grandmother, his mother, being raised on a farm, she canned everything, like, great beautiful gardens and so my father always had his own garden my mother canned and she grows everything a very a really big garden but the but so we were raised on this meat and potato diet but everything still sort of from the garden and so it wasn't until high school that the transition began and it became slowly I mean he was okay in home with the Karen we need to sort of cut out the meat and so the meat became more as a spice, you know, it wasn't a serving. It mm -hmm. was more like, you know, scalloped potatoes with one slice of ham chopped up in it. And, and then uh, little by little, you know, I, I went away to college. And when I came back from, you know, my sophomore year and opened the refrigerator, there were all these plant-based milks in the refrigerator and plant-based ice creams and the cheese was sort of gone. And so it was, it was little by little we always knew sort of what he was doing. He shared a lot of, of his work with us. It, and, and I, in fact, I actually, in college, I was studying community health or community nutrition at Cornell as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And I, one summer I worked in his lab 
And that's when they were getting all their samples back from China. And that was with Oxford University at the time too. And I was proportioning urine for eight hours a day, which was probably the worst job you can ever imagine for, you know, five days a week and in, into the sample, the vials, and then they were testing it. But, and, but for me, I, I, I became more convinced actually after I left in college, you know, so he was doing, getting these health results. And then I was in the Dominican Republic and I sort of came to my own conclusions through environmental humanitarian reasons why I also would, became very committed to this lifestyle. And, and like you know, I ended up raising two sons, now 20 and 25, completely on a plant-based diet. I chose at that time that I was going to do this for you know, other reasons in addition to health. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for catching me up on this. I had no idea like sort of the time frame and that you really came out it, even though you knew your dad's work, you came at it from more of a, almost veganism and from in terms of uh, the environment and the ad, right and the animals and also just social justice right right i was working actually in a, it was more i was rehabilitating malnourished children and living in a clinic in the mountains and you know i was reading a diet for a small planet at the same time and and it was totally unsustainable you know this kind of uh, animal based livestock you know kind of of diet it's not sustainable for and so you know i was i was looking at this and i was having some of my own personal experiences and i was totally convinced on my own through my own work that you know i i wanted to, to when i raised and had my own family i was going to raise them on a plant-based diet so um yeah. since you were raised it is interesting though when we think about um, the different kinds of diets that, the, that are the most healthful. The worst is sort of the processed food and meat and animal product heavy diet. And the best is probably a whole plant food diet. And in between is this one that maybe you were raised on, which was very natural. It's sort of You had a lot of fruits and vegetables that came from the garden. They were probably organic, right? Organically grown. And they yes, were. There was, and yes, there was, there was meat, but it wasn't the processed food that, that a lot of Americans are raised on, so it is already better. Did you have any health, and it was going off script, but did you have any health issues that did, that you noticed switched for you when you, when you made this transformation maybe in the, in the Dominican Republic? So I, I always had asthma. In high school, I was, you know, I had to go and have my allergy shot once a week, every Wednesday I signed out and went and had this allergy shot. I had, and my mother had asthma also quite bad. And when I went plant-based, the cleared up, I, that totally cleared up. And my mother can sort of say the same thing that, but you know, during those days we were drinking a lot of milk and ice cream and cheese on everything, but my asthma did go away. And I, I haven't had asthma in, in ages. I yeah, I can, I agree with you. I, but I always had that a little inhaler. Yeah. Well, just in case. I also had allergy shots as a kid and had a lot of milk, but also had to take Zyrtec every day for, th I don't know, 30 years I was taking Zyrtec every, every day until I went plant-based and then I just threw it out years ago, a couple of years ago. So uh, yes, yeah, I can, I can also attest to that. So I know that you did an amazing interview and I would recommend to anybody who's interested because your story is incredible and what you're doing in the Dominican Republic is amazing. You're, you're growing I mean, you said something about the, the amount of food that you're able to grow is just extraordinary. But so please, you know, look at Jean's interview with you. But I wondered if you wanted to say anything else about your work right now in the Dominican Republic. Uh, no, I'm actually, I'm super excited about transitioning some of the work that I'm doing within CNS right now. And there's a Center for Nutrition Studies and trying to incorporate sort of this idea to not not only the resilient and, and regenerative power of a plant-based diet on one's own personal health but also when food is grown in a sustainable fashion you know how it can also help heal our ecosystems and basically that's sort of like some of the knit projects that i'm working on here in the dominican republic is exploring you know when food is grown in a sustainable fashion we're taking over part of the land beside us, which is all cattle ranches. We're trying to bring that land back to fertile land where we're growing you know, these beautiful agro food forests. 
here on my land, I, like I shared in my previous interview, we have just a little over two and a half acres of land, but we have almost 40,000 pounds of food over a two year period that we produce. And next door, you know, the cattle ranches, the one cow for that same amount of land, 400 pounds of animal flesh. So it's big, massive difference. And in the land, it's coming alive. You know, the land next door, it's, it's sanded, it's hard, it's overheated. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty miserable. It's, Right. So, and so I'm able to incorporate, I think, more of that and now coming into CNS with our new service program that we're doing. And we're going to be giving out grants worldwide to right. try to promote and stimulate, you know, this kind of understanding of recognition of and taking action within our communities to sort of promote that idea of personal health that, that you know, with that theme, the regenerative, resilient power of a plant based diet, whole food plant based diet. We don't have too much time to waste. No, right. we don't. Not no. at all. Right. Not at all. Yeah. Well, let's get well, back to the... Oh, Jean, you were going to ask a question. I am. On this whole situation. So, <laughs> well, I know you're excited because like, wow, Link, Dr. Campbell is here. I mean, this is like, both of us are just like positively vibrating. We're like, wow. Because I think, you know, and congratulations on your, your new position because Honestly, with everything in your background from all you did in Dominican Republic and all the, the projects that you have going on, they couldn't have found a better person. Seriously. I mean, in terms of everything that you've done. So well done to you. Kudos. So I just have to tip my hat to you and say, wow, girlfriend, you, you, perfect. Everything you've done has prepared you for this, for this job. So and thank you, Jane. That's very nice of you. Yeah. Well, you had two kids, two boys, and you raised them plant-based. So were you plant-based? I can't remember for both of your pregnancies. And how did that go with your kids? I mean, growing up, was it hard? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I did. I actually had both pregnancies plant-based. So my uh, oldest son is Stephen. He's now 26 years of age. And both full pregnancies plant based. Then, when they they were raised plant based completely, and you know, so you know, I had made that commitment not to have uh, animal products in the home. I, I guess I wasn't. I'll be candid with you. I wasn't as serious with the oil or the sugar, you know, as I am now. And for many different reasons, I'm very very strict about you know the oil free and sugar. But I was more of a, I, I was more of a, on with a vegan type diet, but not as strict with the sugar and oil. My oldest son is now almost six foot five and very tall. And, you know, growing up throughout, throughout his childhood, my other, my second son is close to six foot. You know, where did he get his protein from? And they were both incredible athletes and, you know, on the state all-star soccer team in North Carolina and incredibly strong students in school, you know, graduating at the top of their class. And, you know, so I don't think, you know, this plant-based diet stunted them in any, in any way. And for me, what was important in, is I wanted them to be, feel comfortable too and their own skin with this kind of lifestyle. So it, it, it was when they were younger, I sort of exposed them to, I remember going to a factory farm with them, my father and my mother, and you know, just talking about all of these topics with them. And they were very committed from you know, a very young age. They're, they're, they're very committed and they're very comfortable with you know, their diet choices in this lifestyle. So, and, and as we know, it's, it's, there's a lot of other reasons why. So they're very healthy. I think that it, it was at times, it was a challenge, you know, we lived in Mississippi. It, it, sometimes it was, we always had, they always had to take a bag to lunch to school every day. It was, school lunches were almost impossible to eat, right? So, and my younger son used to make it a game in first grade. He would call it the surprise, you know, the mystery, mystery mix. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the teacher was always tickled pink, his kindergarten teacher. She was like, he would pull out his lunch and say, okay, have everyone guess what I'm eating. And, you know, it's just like this, 
all these little odd things mixed together and people were like, oh, what is that? And he was always having fun with his lunch with, with all his classmates. But they, they are very comfortable with, with this decision and what they're doing. So, and for the most part, I think their friends are, their friends and their parents, they understood if they were going for a sleepover, I sometimes would pack up a, another lunch for them, another packed meal and they would take it with them. But they, they generally had everyone was pretty accepting and open and supportive of it. So. Can I ask if they went, I mean, people always worry about this. So one thing I would asking, I would ask, what was a typical lunch that you would send your sort of your teenager to school with? Yeah, because they eat a lot of food. And two very active boys that are playing both high school sports and on a club team. So they're very, very active. And what we often did is I would make a big dinner and I would always take half of it and just say, okay, guys, this is going to be for school lunch tomorrow or, you know, or a third of it. They would take leftovers pretty much almost every. And when we didn't have leftovers, you know, would pack up two or three sandwiches and fruit and you know i make or some kind of homemade some cookies too and and a lot of fruit and yeah they would pretty but most of the time it was leftovers i would say the bulk of the time i would say maybe 70 percent of the time it was leftovers that's great i mean that's what i do for work uh, when i have when i take my lunch to work because i don't eat so now about the strictness if kids went if your kids went to a a friend's birthday party and there was you know, cupcakes or cake or ice cream, what, what would they do? They wouldn't have the, like the, the ice cream and, you know, I occasionally they would have a, a cupcake, but a lot of times they wouldn't, they, neither one, I, I don't know where they, they got this from, but neither one liked their sweets because I love my sweets <laughs> and um, I'm not quite sure where they got their and neither one of they're they're not not big into sweets at all. So and I I I sort of still have a problem with sweets. So well yeah. it's pretty it's pretty basic for humans yeah. to you know to crave that. But thank you for all of that. That's fantastic. I've got a question about you were in Mississippi. You were in Mississippi, not disparaging Mississippi, but you were in Mississippi. So how how did you find was it difficult to find a responsive doc or midwife who did you have a midwife delivering you or did you deliver at home or how did that go how were the pregnancies yeah so my second son I actually wanted to have a midwife or I I did have a midwife for my second son but my first son was a family friend a doctor that we had for a very very long time and he actually was you know vegetarian he wasn't 100% on a, a vegan type diet but he was vegetarian and so he was the doctor for my first son, very supportive of my diet. And I actually had a very long, long delivery with him. He was it, almost 24 hours. It was a, very painful. Yeah, it, but, um, but you know, he was very big, um, like 10 two, mm -hmm. And so on a plant-based diet, right? And very, very big. And he was overdue, but he was, he was, and yeah, I mean, they, and then my second son, it was a much easier birth. And, and I had, I was, at the time I was working in Winchester, Virginia, in a migrant, directing a migrant Head Start Center. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was uh, a lot easier, very, a lot easier. And oh, um, yes, when you have a 10, a 10 pound baby paving the way, that's second baby right. sort of slide out. He did, it just came yeah. out. It was, it was, oh, it was a lot and, easier. And no gestational diabetes, and then they test you the second time. No, it just just generally big. Wow, amazing! How much weight? Can I ask how much weight did you gain with this big with the first baby? With your um, son? you know, actually, it was like 20, 24, 25 mm -hmm. pounds. Amazing! I, I'm pretty active. I'm, I'm pretty active, and so I do a lot of walking. And with both of my both my sons during the pregnancy, I I actually went out and pretty much walked every day as well. So. Did you take prenatal vitamins? Did you take prenatal vitamins or did you take other supplements? People are always wondering. And, you know, we talk about uh, optimizing nutrition, but optimizing some supplements like B12 and other. And what did you do for your pregnancies? So, you know, Deborah, I, during those years, gosh, that was, uh, 
almost 26, 27, 27 years ago. I didn't really take too many prenatal, and I, I probably should have taken more. My, but I, I took them occasionally, but not, not very much. And vitamin B12, I actually haven't even started taking that until just recently. And I know, I, I, I know people should be taking it a lot more. And I, here in the Dominican Republic, when I went, went home, I realized I needed to take it on a regular basis. So I'm taking B12 now on a very regular basis. I'm the kind of person for the most part that I, I sort of avoid the, avoid the, the doctor's office and the, and, and so I, but I'm my brother now is the doctor and he's always getting after me, Leanne, you need to go have a checkup and you know, you need to get your, so. Well, the best way to avoid a doctor is to be on a plant-based diet. So you're yes, right. But, but, but B12 is important, especially to have enough in your breast milk to give the baby. So you might have dodged a, to dodge a bullet and I wouldn't recommend, but well, it's interesting that you say that because my older son, Stephen, I didn't have quite enough milk for him. And in fact, my sister-in-law, Kim, at the time, she had just had a child, Colin, her son, who was one month older than Stephen, and she would pump milk and we would actually give that to Stephen. So nice. she helped supplement my milk. And so uh, Stephen was... Yeah, raised on her breast milk and mine. So well, hopefully she was taking her B12. <laughs> yeah. Obviously so. your kids are fine and no, there's no deficiencies. So that's no, fine. you're totally right. You're totally right. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was thinking back to my own childhood growing up, you know, because we clearly were not playing place. But I have to say my parents raised five kids and they had we had a big garden out back too. And, you know, there was always usually a main piece of meat and then veg, you know, we started a salad and then there was at least always two vegetables on our plate. We rarely had dessert and there was just milk, water, or orange juice in the refrigerator. There was never soda and there was no candy or chips or any processed foods at all in our house. So, you know, but, uh, you know, growing up, I think about this all the time now, you know, as I'm reflecting back, cause I've gone plant-based, you know, I constantly had strep throats. I had ear infections. I was on so many antibiotics all the time and, you know, just comparing it to like your kids, you know, how was it raising plant-based children? I mean, were you ever like doing this unofficial comparison like mothers do, <laughs> you know, like when you see your kids next to the other kids and, you know, were you comparing yours to the other kids in, as they were growing up? Well, you know, it, it, that's, an, that's a good question because there were some moments when my, especially when in their early years in Chapel Hill, kindergarten and first grade, around those grades, they're just a, a year apart. But they did have, you know, occasionally some, uh, some cheese on something that wasn't 100% plant-based. And you know what? Clockwork, they had an ear infection. <gasps> And, and it was just, it was amazing. And my mother said, well, Leanne, did they have some cheese? And I'm like, yeah, and they would, they would get it just like, almost like that. It was incredible. But, um, you know, de definitely, I think that, uh, goodness, that little, you know, that little pink body of antibiotics that it sort of seems to be a common thing in a lot of people's refrigerators. But my sons, once, you know, they with no no dairy i think it was more the dairy more than anything that triggered that and taking that completely out they would go for you know a school year without having a sick day they had an incredible attendance record i was sick a lot but you know i yeah. drank so much milk and so we had so much cheese and ice cream yeah and, <laughs> and similar to what we didn't have that much soda also in the house either it, for myself and my own childhood. So I, yeah, I don't remember. We didn't have that, that much. We had the same thing. It was just milk, juice, and water, orange juice. And just that was it. So tab. <laughs> that was disgusting. That tab. I mean, that really was bad. You had to be. Yeah. And I know gr growing up, I, you know, was always on a diet my whole life, you know, trying to lose weight. And tab that just was disgusting it really was fresca that's great so i know you're growing up on a farm and eating eating fresh food so important you know i grew up in new jersey and i don't really remember having 
a salad. I mean, there were Jersey tomatoes and sometimes we and corn and peas that we get, but mostly, look, it was, you know, we had spam and bologna and eggs and, oh, geez. So anyway, back, back to you, Jean. All know. right. Well, Dr. Campbell, can you explain what is meant by regenerative farming and why this is so important? Yes. So basically the land beside me, the classic example, that used to be a forested farm. You know, it, lots of the land was all owned by sort of most of the families in this village. And the land then was deforested and sold to one landowner who lives most of the year in the States. And it's very easy to raise cattle compared to, you know, trying to grow, grow crops. You have to pay more people, there's more oversight and so on. So the land has been totally cleared off and all the trees and everything. And, you know, there's the thing too that the, the guys who work for me, they call it overheating. You know, it's, it's with the land being cleared off, organic matter doesn't come down. It's not being recycled through the land. The land is a lot harder, also overheated, and there's been a lot of erosion. I mean, we purchased part of that when I first came here, but when we first bought the land, it was pretty much useless in terms of trying to grow food in it. And it, it's taken, you know, a, a couple years to bring it back to life. And so that's that regenerative bringing that land back to its fertile state where now you know the the what we recently purchased it, it we have lots of cassava growing there orange trees great you know lemon trees and plantains and it's it's full of different kinds of of trees but initially we could not grow that there in the first year at pretty much almost everything kept dying and so it took a lot of mulching and mulching and mulching and bringing in additional organic matter and and bringing it back to it's 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 still not quite 100% where it was you know before but it's it's a lot more fertile now and more productive so yeah I, I don't think people understand, not everybody understands that dirt or soil is really alive when it's healthy, right. right? It's filled with microorganisms that, and that's lost when it becomes, right, overheated and there's nothing. Exactly. Did you, so did you, you're talking about mulching and I've talked to people who say, oh, we, we're never going to be able to get rid of all, you know, this animal-based agriculture because we need the animals for their, for their fecal matter to, to fertilize the ground. And I'm just wondering what you would say about that. I mean, I've talked to some environmentalists who say that they, we need their, we need the, you know, I, I don't know anything about that, but you obviously do because you've been farming. So what would you say about that? Well, you know, I, everything here, it's not, at least some of the family farms here, they're not with the, the hormones that, that people add to their, so, so there are like certain areas I know they were going down to this one place in Cariñosa where there used to be a, you know, family, family, small family pig pen, right? And the matter there that it wasn't the insecticide, like the hormone type of, um, but uh, that land was very, very, very rich. And so where that the old pig pen was, and they would, they would bring that up here as well. But for the most part, I would say almost everything. You know, I mean, if, if you, there's a book, my son is also building his own permaculture farm in North Carolina. We just bought some land and he's also creating his, his but um, there's a whole, even a whole book called, it's, it sounds really gross, it's humanure. You know, even human feces, if you process it all that in the right way, I mean, there's, there's a use. I mean, everything is organic when it goes through the cycle. It's just, I think it's really bad when you start adding all those, those hormones to the, to the to the animals and the, the to making you know then their feces it's it's yeah it's, it's not good matter but for the most part I, I live here beside a on our land we have a lot of cacao trees coffee plants as well and avocados and sapotes there's a lot of leaves that fall down and that so we're constantly making and mulching with that and so we have a lot of stuff that we are trying to cover and, and bring that soil, like you said, back to life, you know, getting the worms back in there and getting the, you know, but we have to lower the temperature. That's the whole reason for the mulching is like you said, is once you get to a certain temperature, you know, keep getting that temperature lower so they come back to life. Yeah. yeah. 
I had heard that hemp is a particularly healthy plant to grow for the soil. And had you heard anything about hemp? I don't. And Stephen would probably know a lot more about that because I think in North Carolina now they are growing a lot, you know, a lot more hemp. Got a couple good friends who are working on hemp farms. But yeah, Stephen is my younger, my older son now is really getting into and do that as well. So. Fantastic. So yeah. um, just as one last question before we say goodbye, but do you have anything sort of, uh, to, that you would say to women who are thinking about getting pregnant in the next year after this pandemic is under more control about changing their diet and what would be, what do you think would be the most, you know, something, something inspirational to, to tell them that, you know, that might encourage them to make this switch if they haven't already? Right. I, I, th I, I think uh, educating yourself is incredibly important. And I think there are so many wonderful books out there right now. And you can read about this kind of lifestyle from different angles. Melanie Joy's book as well. You know, just, just going in all and, and then out from the, uh, of course, I'm going to say the China study too. Eh? It's got like over 400, you know, references, all the science within that. It's, it's so it's very powerful. And and to, to educate yourself, I, I know there's so much misinformation out there. And, and I think when you, and now there's also so many great books to get in terms of how to prepare this food and, and so many recipes online you can find. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, it, for yourself and for, you know, for the planet, this is, this is the best way. I, get off the diet, you realize that there are so many other foods to eat that you never even imagined. And it's sort of like, it just goes. On that note, your, your sister-in-law, I got a bunch of pictures from her because we did a couple shows together and she, her photography is amazing. And so she gave me a bunch of her pictures and I, cause people kept asking me, what do you eat? You know, salads. And I'm like, Oh no, no, no. I'm such a foodie. And so, you know, I took a bunch of her pictures and a bunch of my pictures and put them together into like a two, three minute food porn, you know, like a, a picture a yeah. second and you know, here's what I eat. So, and I just have to put a shout out to you because your cookbook is phenomenal. Oh my God, if you've not seen Dr. Campbell's cookbook, wow. Then there's several different yeah. versions of it because you, you came back and- The last edition is, is, um, is nice. The first edition, I, we sort of did that with my son was the photographer for that. But the last edition, I agree, Jean, it's a lot, it's a lot nicer, that last edition of it. Yep. Beautiful yeah. pictures and the recipes, please. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Really good stuff. Yeah. Really good. I mean, thank you so if you're much. looking for good cookbooks, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for everything you're doing and everything that you're going to be doing, also bringing it back to North Carolina. And um, it's really it's, just wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to be with us here today and share with us your knowledge. And congratulations again on your, your new job and well done to you. Thank you. Thank you.